And it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the first workshop of the series uh, Prague Digital Humanities in Early Music Research. Uh, it's great that uh, this has actually become a series now that we are entering its second year. The first year was thought up by uh, Jana Frankova, a colleague of ours from uh, the Old Myth New Facts project of which I'm an employee and which is paying for this event. Um, we have again for this year uh, multiple sessions planned. Uh, this year it will be actually four instead of three because we entered a collaboration with the Bohuslav Markinu Institute in Prague who will host a session later in autumn uh, about uh, modern notation in MEI uh, with colleagues from the Beethoven Spectrum Project. So we, we will have also some less early music later during the year. But for now, uh, we are focusing on one of the hottest tools that have been for many years already uh, talked about as something that could help musicological research very much in the digital domain and that is optical music recognition. And uh, for talking about uh, optical music recognition or OMR, we have today the singularly most qualified person ever on this topic. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ich, but it's true. Uh, Professor Ichiro Fujinaga from McGill University, who has been working on OMR for his basically whole life. Uh, I've read his uh, master thesis way back when I was uh, starting work on OMR as, as my PhD. And basically, we, the whole field is building on his work uh, from back then uh, up till today. And it's not really an exaggeration. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we will see why this has been the case uh, in his presentation of the optical music recognition workflow uh, on the SIMSA project. So with this, uh, I'm very happy to hand this over to H. Thank you, Jan. Uh, yeah, the, the, those are all exaggerations. There are many, many people who've been working on this OMR project. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ichiro Fujinaga. I'm at the uh, music technology area of Schulich School of Music at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. So I'll be talking about this uh, long-term project called Single Interface for Music Score Searching and Analysis, also known as SIMSA project. And today I will be talking about optical music recognition work for immune notation, which is basically sort of the up-to-date uh, report and where we are in this project. So, if I have to describe this project in two words, I say it's Google scores, uh, meaning it's sort of like Google books minus Google because I have not made any contract with Google. I don't really intend to, uh, but it, it's similar in the sense that it allows full text search. And it is this optical music recognition, which enables this full text search. Of course, you can enter everything manually by hand. It's also possible, but we're trying to save people's uh, hands and wrists uh, by using the computer to help us get music into the computer so we can do full text search. Another major part of the SIMSA projects be able to do uh, analysis and queries once we have the music that is searchable. And finally, access to, we want to have access to these digitized scores worldwide from a single website. So that you don't have to go to several different sites to look for the things you want to look for. So this is a 11 year project now. It is our basically last year. Uh, we will officially, well, officially end in next, next March actually, uh, but well, it's been a long time coming. So this is sort of like 
a summary. It's not quite finished, uh, but I will we'll give you sort of the overview of what the system does now. So the big picture, the vision is sort of global music library and OMR, optical music recognition, uh, plays the central part in this. Uh, and of course, we have now quite a bit of digitized music. Uh, many of these are early music and it's still growing. When we started 10, 12 years ago, there weren't that many, but it's, we, we have quite a bit of uh, high quality digitized images of music, so that really helps. Um, we'll also have books. So we've, al we've always been interested in find sort of forgotten music that are that is music that's in books, uh, regular books, non-music books that may have a few pages of scores and music in, in them. So part of this project is to look for those sort of forgotten uh, music. And of course we have as our partners major libraries who have, as you all know, lots of music and they've been very helpful in, in digitizing uh, early music as well. We've always had fairly good metadata uh, things like Cantus, Rhythm, um, and text for uh, to help us along. And we also have tools that will aid us in analysis. So we use things like Humdrum and Music 21 to do sort of the, the search and analysis as, as well. So our dream was to, uh, to build it and people will come and use the system. So that was the big picture. Now the SIMSA is a large uh, team with many, many people who contribute to it. There are about 20 musicologists, music librarians, lots of sort of music technologists or software developers. And we have partners, including Bavarian State, the Big Tech Nothing of the Songs, British Library, Harvard, Patty Trust, and New York Philharmonic Archives, and many, many others. You can check those uh, if you want to look at our website, the simsa.ca. So brief introduction to optical music recognition. It's a process of converting images of music scores into a symbolic computer representation, such as MIDI, Music XML or MEI, or Music Encoding Initiative. So you start out with, with a digitized image of music, then you convert that into a computer readable format. Uh, what's on the right is just a snippet of an MEI, and this, whole, this, this simple process is called OMR. Uh, there are a few steps involved in OMR, and I'll just briefly look at that. Uh, so again, you start with the digital scores. There are ma basically three major steps, uh, image pre-processing, musical symbol recognition, and music notation reconstruction. Uh, within each of those, there are several sub-steps, if you like. Uh, image pre-processing may involve binarization, that is converting a, either a color or grade scaled image into black and white images, uh, noise removal, things that you don't, you're not really interested in, uh, structural analysis, things like how many staves there are, if there are any text on it, any annotation, pictures, we need to know where the music is in, in in, in the context of the entire page. And then we, after that, we segment images into the things that we, we were interested in, so things like uh, decorated initials, uh, actual nodes or neums, and text, etc. And once you have it separated, we can start 
looking at things specifically, things like staves processing uh, or symbol segmentation, that is splitting, uh, separating different symbols on a page. And then once we have it separated, we can try to classify these symbols, that is uh, assigning names to whatever we find on the page. Then once we have them classified, we can sort of start combining things in, in more, more modern notation. You might want to uh, combine a node head with a stem and a beam, etc. Uh, then after that, uh, knowing what, what, where the, where the notes are or glyphs or neumes are and knowing where the uh, clef is and where it sits on the stave, if there's a stave, uh, we'll try to assign meanings to it, things like pitch and rhythmic values, if we know about them. And then finally, we can put the whole thing together, back together again, and then get the final output as uh, symbolic file format. So that's sort of the big picture. So for NUM notation, uh, I guess this crowd, uh, We'll know most of this. So early Western music notation system anywhere from around 10th to 16th century. So this is our favorite uh, Salzine manuscript uh, that actually sits in, uh, we have it in Canada, one of the very few that we have in Canada. And there are, of course, many others. And, and you can score yourself how fast you can identify these other ones I'm gonna show you in a second. But <clears throat> just, to, just to show, people that there are many different types of uh, notation system in those days. <clears throat> Did you get 100%? More? <clears throat> you know what that is, most of you. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at the sort of workflow for new notation in particular. So SIMSA wasn't really designed specifically for NUMS, but uh, we've been concentrating, concentrating on that. So that's what we will talk about. And this workflow will be actually demonstrated more in detail tomorrow uh, by Martha Tomei in uh, tomorrow's session. But I'll sort of give you the overview today. So again, we start with digitized manuscript. So we do what's called the laid out analysis and corrections. Uh, that is, we try to separate different parts of the music. Again, things like staves and notes and text. And we use a tool called pixel.js. Um, then after we have the, these layout or uh, different parts of the, the image classified, we can get into the symbols, so the, the actual nubes in this case, using a, a tool called Interactive Classifier. And for this, we also use uh, what's called the new mapping tool. This will allow us to map, <coughs> that is to associate a symbol or new to actual code, such as MEI coding, so that we can have a correspondence between what the image is and how we're going to represent it in the computer. Then we, uh, after we do all that, we sort of automatically assign pitch, knowing where the staves are and the clef. Then we do what's called a lyric aligner. We call it a liner because we already have lyrics that's provided by the Kansas database. Uh, so what we do is knowing the text on the page and the image and knowing what it should be from the canthus and we'll just align them to figure it out and we generate the output into mei and then we do corrections because omr process is never perfect so we need to correct manually and we use a tool called neon.js note that all these are js stands for javascript so this uh, means that everything is done on the web page. And if you have a browser, you can have access to all this. That was the sort of the whole uh, point of doing this as a single uh, interface. And then after we have everything done, we put everything 
back together in what we call the Cantus Daltimus interface, uh, which we use uh, a technology, relatively new technology called IIIF, which allows us to um, get images from the sources, that is the, the libraries or archives that host these images without downloading the whole file, uh, the image file, which, which tends to be big. So we only have to uh, download portion of the, the manuscript that we, we or the user needs to see and display that. And we also combine uh, the, the great metadata that you have from Encantus and show that as well in this Canthus Altimus interface. Okay, so let me go through some of the ideas. So this whole thing is controlled by a system called Rodan, Workflow Management System. This was a PhD work by Andrew Hankinson, whom some of you know, who sort of made this whole thing work in one large system. And again, you'll see that in action tomorrow. Martha. Okay, so let me give you an example how things are done as different steps in OMR. So here we have this beautiful image. And the first thing we do, we be converting uh, the color image into grade scale. And once we have that, we can make that into binary. We do this because computers are can work much easier and faster if it's just black and white pixels and for most of our work that's all that's the only information we need we don't need to know, have information about colors or even grayscale to know what the pitches are or even what the texts are and once we do that we take out anything that we're not interested in because we're just doing the music for now and this is not that simple uh, for computers. Computers are really not very smart, so you have to be very careful about uh, teaching it or instructing it what to do to remove sort of what's non-essential in this case, uh, pixels from the image. So after we do that, we can remove the text somehow, and then we remove the staff. Now, most musicians freak out when you remove the stage staff lines because then we have no idea what the pitches are. But uh, computers are smart in this case because it knows where everything is, exact position of these black pixels. So even if you remove the staves and it knows where they were, so you can always come back and figure out which note sits on which, which staff line or between each staff line. On the other hand, Computers not good at figuring what's in the background and foreground. Humans are really, really good at this, figuring what's in the background and for, and that's how we move around in the world, knowing not not bump into um, uh, tables or chairs or whatever. Uh, but again, in this case, computers not good, so it's not that trivial to remove these staff lines because they, as you know, they overlap uh, with the symbol in the front. So, but. We need to do this if we want to simply find out what different components there are of these uh, the nubes. So now you can sort of see that things are separated out. So then we can do the symbol uh, classification or shape classification. So now we know what we can figure out what, what the clefs are and what are the uh, notes or nubes are. Then once we know that can finally figure out what um, what the pitches are and we can do this by putting back the staves then we can finally assign pitches because knowing where the in this case the C clef we can see that this is a C clef and this is a D D C D E D E etc so we can do that then we can put everything back the original image. So the big question is, well, nothing's changed from the, new, the image we started and the image we have now, but there's a huge difference. Now we know where things are now. So we know where the uh, names are and we know 
what these pitches are because we know where the stop lines were, right? So that's the whole process of doing that. But, and there are many steps, but about four years ago now, there was a major breakthrough uh, by uh, one PhD student back then, uh, a guy named Jorge Calvo Zaragoza, who came out with one step layout analysis. So what this does, it replaces the first five steps here into one step. So we only have to do this once, to do this, all these different steps. Uh, that is grayscale, binarization, border removal, lyric removal, staff removal, all that in one single step. And I'll talk to you about this amazing breakthrough. So, so what we want to do is, is separate different portion of, of the music. So here we have three outputs in one step. So you use, this is your original image. And here's the binarized image and with the text that is red and staves or staff lines in blue. And this is all done in one step. And you might have heard of convolutional neural networks or deep learning. And that's this is what it does for you. Uh, so here's another example of separating staves and notes and text. And you do this in one step. Remember, we took about five different steps to do it previously. So how does it do this? So whenever you're doing a machine learning, uh, in particular what's called a supervised machine learning, you have to train it. You have to teach it how to do things. In this case, to recognize different parts of an image. And in order to teach it, we create what's called the training data. The training data is what the machine learning used to learn. And the training data is often refer referred as ground truth. And this is how uh, the ground truth for this, this learning machine uh, is created. So what it does is, is, is pretty crazy, actually. So how it learns or what it tries to do is it tries to categorize or classify every single pixel of an image, which may contain more than a million pixels, right? Uh, and for each pixel that it tries to uh, classify, you take a little window like this, and you're only interested in the very center of that image. So just one single spot, one pixel is what you're trying to classify. So here, uh, you're looking at uh, a new here and you're only looking at the very middle of this pixel. Now, what you got to have to tell is it's a note, or at least it's a music part of a music symbol. Here in the middle one, you have this uh, red part of the red staff line, but all it's interesting, interested, or want to know about is the one single pixel in the middle. And so this will be classified as a part of a staff line. And here again, you're only looking at one thing, but this will be classified or be told that this is part of the text, right? So this is what you have to do for every single pixel. And as you saw before, we have different size of window. So what it's really doing is trying to figure out what that middle point is by knowing its context or its, its window around it. So we try different size of windows. So this is like 11 by 11 pixel, 25 by 12 pixels or 51 by 51. So again, this is for the background, this is for the text, this is for a symbol, and this is for the staff line. And we tried different size of windows and we came, I think we're currently using about 51 by 51 pixel to teach um, this, this system. So here are more examples. So these are all uh, example of the background, right? It's in the background and not in not neither text or music or lyrics. So again, you're only looking at a single point in the middle here. It's the center of these, each of these windows. Okay. So this is how it looks like if you combine everything. 
So here the red are the text uh, and, and the black are musical symbols, blue pixel is represent the staff line and the white is what I consider as the background, right? So uh, a little dot like this, that's sort of noisy specs or even some bleed through are considered background. So that's what's considered all white. So now we have four classes here, background, uh, text, staff line, and music. So it's separating into four things. So uh, once we do that, uh, we can have it learn how to do this. So uh, without going too much detail, um, the, the neural network model that we, we're using currently is what's called a selectional auto encoders. So basically uh, you feed this original image, encode it to a certain an internal representation and, and the neural network or somehow decode it. So it just comes up with this. This is what we're looking for. So it, it how it sort of intuitively uh, works is that it'll encode parts of the image so that when it encodes it, it comes up with only the things that you want. So here's, if you combine all that for, for the four classes that I was talking about, can have an encoder just to the background. So you just note that the white image is uh, what we consider the background. So the staff line, so this is the sort of staff line encoder. So if you encode this image, what it comes out is just the staff line and this for the notes and this for the text. And at the end, we can combine the output so that, that you see the whole uh, image classifying into four different sections or layouts or layers. Okay, so um, here are some of the uh, initial testing of this, this system. So uh, I talked about the selection of encoders in the original version called Convolution Neural Nets. And we tried it with two manuscripts, uh, Sao Zins and Einstein uh, Allen. And here's some of the results. So this is the uh, the encoding one, selection over encoder. This is the original CNN, convolutional neural network. These are the sort of the accuracy. You can sort of look like a, a percentage of accuracy for these two manuscripts. And note that the original CNN. This is why um, Jorge worked on this selection over encoder. Is that when it was classifying it would take about six hours of computer time. And this is on, on a very high performance computer uh, that has what's called a GPU or graphic uh, processing unit, but it still took about six hours. But with the SAE it only takes about a minute. So that's one of the reasons we're using SAE. We, we still use combination of these, uh, but that explains why we have uh, two versions of uh, neural networks. Now, we still need to create these ground truths for every single pixel, right? Uh, so we created a tool called pixel.js that allows you to sort of efficiently uh, mark up a page so that they're in uh, different layers which the machine can learn. So this is called the pixel.js. Now, problem is that if you try to annotate, actually somebody actually did this, annotate every single pixel, which there were about 30 million pixels. So it took three days to do a page or 24 hours of just painstakingly annotating every single pixel, if it's a staff line, background, uh, note, or text. I mean, this, this pixel.js does make it slightly easier but it's way, way too long. And you need typically uh, these neural networks need two, three, four pages uh, to be annotated before you can start to perform well. So what we decided to do was actually use neural nets 
these machine learning algorithms to help us create ground truth. So what we do is we only uh, annotate parts of the image. So we look at, we select parts of the image and we only uh, annotate that part. And once we do that, we send that to the, the neural net and it'll do, knowing just this portion, it'll try to do the whole page. Now it won't be correct uh, totally, but it, it would be better than it if it wasn't taught at all. So what we do is what's called the incremental learning, right? So we, we teach a little bit of it and we have it learn. The next time it does, we correct the output, which will take a lot less time than doing this whole thing from the, from scratch. And we do uh, do this back and forth. We, we teach a little bit, we have it learn, teach more, we have it learn, and that's how we create our ground truth. So uh, here's some example here, how we do this. Note that it's, it's fairly detailed. Uh, so here's the original. And here's the ground truth that uh, one of our students created. And that's this is what goes into the neural net uh, to be trained. So here's sort of a result of how well it can do after after a few iteration of this teaching session or training session. So here's the original the page. And here's the output. This is the output that it learned to do. So it may look fairly good, but there are some things that are not quite right. Um, I think here at the bottom, this this letter is still considered a note here. So what, what's on the right should be just notes or musical symbols. You, you can have these uh, lines. Uh, there's some artifacts in here, but it's it's not so bad. So note that this, this functum is not quite there. Some parts of it missed. Christophe, it's pretty good. Christophe, put it on his start. Okay, I'll just keep going. Uh, here's the staff lines. Again, it's just the staff line that we can see. So this is pretty good, but here again, it thought that this part of this S, letter S, because it's fairly uh, vertical, and I think it's using color to identify. So another example is here. This, this is an A, there's a straight line here. So it's done that because it's red. So it's think this is a staff line. Although this, the top line of A didn't get classified as A, it's probably because uh, it's in a different color. So it does use color information. Uh, the other thing about neural nets, as you may know, uh, is that we don't know what it's really doing. We can sort of guess, uh, but uh, often we don't know why it's doing the things it's doing. Uh, you can see here this A, top of A again, and bottom of A, again, it's a straight thin line. Uh, therefore, I think it's a staff line, but it's not a huge problem. Uh, so if we combine those two, we can see more where, where things are. These aren't really staff lines, but it doesn't really matter because we won't be looking for pits in that neighborhood because there's no means there. Here's the text. Uh, remember that, that bottom, this, this, this letter here was missing, so it's because it classified as, as note, part of a note. Uh, it looks a little bit like a ligature, right? So, and again here, the part part of that missing num here, or punctum here, uh, shows up here. Um, this is good. This is this was a bleed through right here, and it knows it should be a background, and then it's not it's not uh, num. So these things are doing fairly well. And note that it's missing those lines here because it's part of the staff line. But again, this is not a big deal. So if you put all together, it looks pretty good, right? Um, and what the left-hand side, again, is just an image with pixels. But on the right side, we know different classes of these symbols. Okay, 
once we have just the symbols, we just take the musical part and we do the classification, uh, finding out what each of these uh, neumes mean or what they should be considered classified as. And this is done again interactively. We teach a little bit. So what's in the green is what it's taught um, manually. And what's in the green is what the machine guessed to be uh, these things are. So this is just the first time run. So some of these are wrong. Uh, for example, we have the clivis. That looks okay here. But then it thinks these are clivis as well. So what, what would happen in the next round in this interactive classifier is that the sort of the teacher Sure, the trainer would say, well, no, this this is not clevis, or this is not, yeah, here, here there's a bar line here, which shouldn't be. And again, this, this classifier always tells you in context what these things look like. Uh, so this, this, this climacus uh, appears here. So you, people looking at it, uh, or musicologists looking at it to train it, I will know. Uh, what the context these symbols appear. So this is called an interactive classifier. So once 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 um, all the symbols are classified, uh, we can move to the next stage, which will be generating the MEI file. So just a brief, quick review. The Music Encoding Initiative is a community-driven effort to define a system for encoding musical documents in a machine-readable file format. Uh, in XML, uh, developed since 1999. It's based on TEI and XML term to music XML, which I'm going to know about. All right, so what do we have to do to create these MEI files? So we need to take these NUMs on the image or with those classified and convert into the MEI. So what uh, some of the musicologists have done is create these tables. Right, so we have we have an image, and we want to really convert it to corresponding MEI encoding. So here's the punctum. So this is this could be easy. Just just I'm not going to teach you this now, uh, but this NC stand for new component. So NUMs are built up of these new components, which basically represents a pitch. Um, and these are how uh, these images are mapped to uh, the MEI. So names are uh, internal. It doesn't really appear in MEI, but it helps the musicologist to uh, uh, refer to things. There's more examples. So again, as you know, things can get quite complicated. Uh, so these things have to be uh, specify there's no way uh, we can get the machine to learn this it's hard enough for humans to learn all this uh, so uh, we provide this mapping of image to uh, encoding MEI encoding uh, so that the, our system can generate the MEI files so to do that uh, uh, we also created a, a, a web interface so given an image, we can tell it um, its output. And these, 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 this system or this web application will it can import these uh, tables that, that the musicologist created either in Word or Excel tables, and it'll convert it um, into this mapping system. And you can even correct it here online if you like. Okay, so we're about halfway. I'll just, just remind you where we are now. So we did the mapping tool. Uh, and again, at this point, you can automatically figure out the pitch, knowing where the staves are and what the, the position of the nooms. Then next step is the, uh, the lyrics or the text aligner and optical character recognition. That's what OCR stands for and it will be aided by the, the text that's already available in Canvas database. And we output MEI and make the correction and we'll do the uh, final output. 
So I'm just giving you the context where we are. So we'll be talking about the Cantus and OCR in the next few slides. So Cantus database uh, probably needs in no introduction to this audience. Um, it's a database of, of chance and has uh, lots of metadata. And most importantly, it has the text of the chant uh, that we're looking at. Um, what, what Cantus does not provide is where this text are on the page of the image. So uh, even if we know that this chant appears on this particular uh, page uh, or folio, we don't know where it actually is on that page, right? So what we need to do is first we run a um, uh, OCR to figure that out. So this is this is this is the the ground truth. Uh, from from Cantus, we have this data. Actually, it doesn't even know where the, the the line break is. We just make it. We just made it so that it's easier line for this presentation. But it's just single uh, line of text in Cantus. Uh, there there are a few issues, uh, as you know. There you know there are rubrics that are not included here. There are abbreviations um, that shortens. Uh, our text to say parchment and and so we have to um, sort of teach computers about you know there are things that are not part of the text that looks like let there are letters that are not part of the text and that some words are abbreviated and so these things should be taught for to this system um, but given given the OCR so we try to use a, a it's called the open source uh, optical character recognition software. We use what's called Ocropus, uh, which is another uh, neural network to figure text out, and which it does fairly well. Uh, but again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, we just have to figure out where, where texts are on the page because we know what the text should be. Uh, so we just have to align them what's on the page or what the output of the optical character recognition with uh, what's we have, what we have from Cantus. And we use what's called a, a, a sequence alignment. So we have one sequence from Cantus and we have one sequence from the OCR output and we try to make a best match. And we use an algorithm called Needleman Bunch uh, algorithm. So, this is the basic uh, out alignment output, and we can we can try to separate different parts of the text, basically by syllables, and try and align them where these things are. So the one up here are the the ground truth or the text from Cantus, and down here is what what the OCR had figured out. And this part, you know, you would you would you would have recognized these letters, but because it, this doesn't align with anything that's given from Cantus, it is ignored. Um, and again here, uh, you know, there's abbreviation, but this is the best match, right? So we have MEU matching and a QUE matching. So this must be part of, of uh, BAM, etc. So it does this automatically. Next step. So that's, that's the text alignment, but we also have to align these texts with the news, right? So we also try to figure out to which news these texts belong to, right? So this is also a matching problem or alignment problem, finding sort of the nearest uh, set of news that align with the text or the syllables of the text. So this is all done manually and of course this process is not perfect uh on the entire process so we have an editor this is basically our last step to correct all the errors both in the uh, new classification stage and text alignment stage 
and this is called neon.js and it allows you to overlay the original image with the recognized version so if there's anything that doesn't match you can easily see for example here the errors so it allows allows uh, people to adjust uh, the errors or correct the errors so here's you can change the sort of opacity and I, I, I guess you will see more of this tomorrow uh, how it really works in uh, on the page so you can make make your backgrounds uh, background that is the original image more prominent or uh, less prominent in the background so you can see that what 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 the OMR recognized in the front so this was the first version or I think this is a screenshot from the second version there's a new version version 3 uh, which is wonderful new features including uh, background image display with diva.js so diva.js is our viewer for the triple IF uh, images Remember, IIIF allows you to see, uh, uh, retrieve images from uh, different parts of, of the world or libraries and uh, only downloads or puts put on your screen the, the, the parts of the manuscript that you want to see without downloading the whole thing. So what it means is that you can see multiple pages uh, of the neon, not just one page at a time, but you can see the whole uh, manuscript if you like. Um, so, in other words, this what Diva.js does is make it triple IF compliant, which is pretty big deal. Um, you can basically edit whatever you want of the whole manuscript. It's also what what you see in the front actually is rendered by Verovio, as you probably know. Verovio, uh, developed by Laurent Pujain, is an online music engraver, meaning it, it, it's designed to output music or draw music, and that's what we used before. Uh, but Verovio is not editable, right? Uh, you can't edit a Verovio output online. But uh, Juliet, who developed this, made it work. So this is now an editable Verovio output. So uh, this is the first version of Verovio that is editable. I, I should give credit to Laurent, however, he had always had this in mind that eventually Verovio will be editable. So there were, he has built it into the software that this, make, this was possible. So it was uh, uh, relatively easy, if you like, uh, for Juliet to make this happen. But it's very exciting. That he can now edit at least this square notation um, uh, with Barovia. Okay, so once we have all that, oh, one more thing, we forgot about text. So now we can even edit text. Uh, remember, we're doing the text alignment. Of course, there'd be misalignments and it's uh, with the text or the uh, uh, misalignment with, with the new syntax. So we can do all that now uh, in Neon. So after we do all that, we can put everything back together, the original image. So this is this is basically diva.js. So this this portion, um, hopefully some of you have seen the Canthus Ultimus interface, where you can just uh, look at the score. Uh, you see all the metadata about it. You see the um, uh, actual output of the music, and you can also search any sort of sequence of notes or sequence of news. So this puts everything back together so you can um, see the complete output of this OMR process. So in summary, uh, I talked about this optical music recognition workflow for new notation, uh, the SIMSA project, document analysis, convolution of neural networks, and selective auto encoders, about the pixel.js, which does the ground truth, uh, interactive classifier to teach the different symbols or neums in our case, the new mapping tool, which takes these symbol classes into NEI encoding, uh, the optical character recognition and text alignment for the input from Canvas database, the neon 
Google.js editor, which allows to fix all the errors that OMR created. And finally, I would have put all this back together with Canvas Ultimate's user interface. Now, there are many people involved in this making this uh, project work. Uh, this from 2019, because last summer we couldn't really work together because of the pandemic. Uh, hopefully we can get some of these people back this summer. Uh, and of course, that's just summer. Last summer, for the last almost 10 years, there's, there's over 50 people. Most of these are students uh, that worked in our lab to make all this work. Thank you very much. I hope I was So thank you very much for the presentation. If we were live, uh, there would still be applause going on. Uh, since we are not, we have to make do with little icons. But uh, I can imagine that uh, there might be many questions. So uh, feel free to raise your hand. I will do my best to moderate the discussion so that uh, nobody is forgotten, but uh, always only one question is addressed at the same time. Or you can write your questions in the chat as well. And, and I will push them into the discussion. So please feel free to ask. Oh, good. You must have done a really great job. No question. Can I go now? <laughs> well, uh, uh, there is uh, Stefan Morent. Yes, thank you, Ichiro. It was a fascinating presentation and great work for over 10 years. Wow. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, did you consider to uh, you told us that you use the Cantus text to recognize uh, the text on the manuscript. Did you think uh, the other way around, could it be possible to detect the text from the manuscript and use it as an input for Cantus to find out what chant is on the page? So, but or at, use, at least as a lection, as we know, because there are many chants with the same text. So, <laughs> would that work too? Thank you. Well, we, we sort of do that. We, we sort of get a general idea of what the texts are on the manuscript, and we try to match that with what's in Cantus. But maybe maybe I didn't understand your question, Stefan. I thought if you could, uh, if I understand right, you, you would uh, use the Cantus text, which you import. So you prior uh, analyze the, the chant which is on the page and you know which right. text yeah and could you do it the other way around so uh, that you automatically recognize the text on the page and use this to find out which chant is on the page <laughs> i see <laughs> no, we, haven't, we haven't done that no no <laughs> that, yeah I, it, it's, could, yeah which yes it's, it's possible <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's not impossible, but we we work with the assumption that which which we know which manuscript we're working yeah. on, so yeah. we expect yeah. things to be in Cantus. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's if, like if you, yes, if you have like a fragment, true. If you, you know, if you have like one page and you do an OCR and find some text and feed that into Cantus, I guess that is possible. Yeah. yeah, I'm asking because this we are working with fragments and that's our daily work to find out what is on the page. Uh, so. uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but <laughs> but I mean, if it's just one page, I mean, you know, you you professional musicologists can just sort of yeah. figure out what the text are anyway. But, but these are and, two thousand uh, fragments, so <laughs> it's much. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's possible. 
home. And uh, yeah. I mean, Deborah, we, you, you can do just free text search on Canvas, right? Right. Yes, we can. Um, so we would just love it if OCR worked. It would save us a ton of time. I just put that in the comments that, uh, you know, if we didn't have to spend a lot of time typing, but if it already knew the text, okay. they're very standard yeah. texts. So it's possible that if some of that script came up, then we would be able to match it up with one of the standard ones. Sure. And then the our OCR system is adaptable, so it'll get smarter as it sees more text. So yeah, so that's that's something we can look at. Yeah, thank you for that, Stefan. All right, we have a question from Cynthia Pires in the chat. Uh, if there is a beta version or a possibility to test the tool with our own images. Uh, short answer is yes, if it's IIIF compliant, uh, uh, if not, you make it triple F compliant, which is easy, <laughs> easy if you have, if you have somebody who can do this for you, uh, of course, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we can, you can, if you, it's, uh, it's triple IF compliant. So basically you make your images, you just, you need what's to create what's called a triple IF manifest, uh, which basically tells you which which image file corresponds to which page or which folio, if you like. Uh, then then it's relatively easy. And again, if you want to do the text thing, you would need Cantus. Uh, put that into Cantus uh, database. Natural Library of Spain. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're triple IF or not. Uh, some people are still, yeah, are hesitant to make their collection available uh, through triple IF. All right. Next, we had Henry Tremont. Hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think it's, you know, some incredible technology that's really kind of helping facilitate um, a lot of our work. Um, I had a question um, about, um, I, it may be something that may be kind of in development, but um, yeah, I was just wondering whether, um, what, what the kind of, uh, what, what your kind of plans were for things like um, dealing with um, musical or textual erasures. I know you mentioned that um, with things like bleed through, um, that is the kind of stuff that's cleared up, but um, it just made me think about something that I'm doing with a colleague right now, which is looking at a manuscript where the original notes were erased and new ones were written over the top. Um, and and um, yeah, I was just wondering whether that was something that like um, might be kind of um, considered in, like in the pipeline for later on um or whether uh, that there'll be some some kind of technology that will be able to kind of analyze that so yeah um no we haven't really thought about that uh but i can imagine if you again it's it's teaching machine is is not i shouldn't say this but not that different from teaching a beginner so if you can teach a student for example to be able to distinguish between uh, 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 sort of erase notes. So you can make that as a category. So if you can teach it that these are erased notes and these are added notes or newly added notes, uh, because, because they're, I mean, the, the reason you or the professional or the experts can tell the difference must be, has to do with some, some color difference or some shape difference. So if you have those and, um, yeah, maybe you can do that. I, I should warn you that uh, as with most neural networks, you need a lot of training data. So uh, sometimes it might be, unless you have, like Stefan was saying, unless you have thousands of things to uh, analyze, sometimes it's not worth the, the, either the time or the money to teach a machine to do it if you can teach uh, yourselves or your students to do it manually. I don't always uh, 
recommend using machines to do it unless it's a lot of painstaking manual work. And isn't that kind of fun to do this sort of, you know, looking for the erase notes? Isn't that sort of fun thing to do? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next raise hand was from Hannah Vohovavar. Uh, my question went in a very similar direction. The, uh, the page that you have shown us uh, that uh, you trained computer to read it is extremely clean and nice. So when I had, a, if I had a student uh, and I wanted to introduce a student to um, a chart notation, I might have picked this one because it's extremely well readable, but we are dealing with more complicated uh, pages. And uh, where we have text variants or errors, we have, as um, Henry Drabben um, mentioned, we have erasures, we have difficulties of alignment, uh, we have additional uh, corrections uh, in terms that I make non rhythmic notation to a rhythmic notation. So, how would it be, uh, how complicated would it be to teach a computer to read and to distinguish uh, the individual layers of such inscription and to encode it? Great question. So, yes, so you're exactly right. So, we're starting out with easy ones sort of clear examples so that it, it, it'll learn faster and once we get this whole system is actually adaptive that is it'll keep learning so as it sees more manuscripts and different types of manuscripts different types of notation different grades of deterioration hopefully it'll get better so but we can't just start with the really hard hard ones first so we're training it uh, incrementally, slowly, gradually, so it gets smarter and smarter. So uh, we, we don't know how smarter it'll eventually get, uh, uh, but hopefully it'll get uh, fairly well so that, again, even the experts don't have to deal with a lot of uh, manual uh, painstaking work. But, you know, in the end, uh, I, I'm not really trying to put all, you, all of you out of work. I mean, there, there's going to be points where it really needs sort of, you know, uh, knowledge, human knowledge, and sort of perceptional uh, uh, skills that you've you've created over the years that allows you to distinguish these uh, unusual cases. So that that will be always be needed, I think, uh, with human input. But we're work yes, so we're working gradually to more harder problems. Thank you. Uh, more questions in the chat from Andrzej Dobysik, uh, does, uh, is there Kustos recognition as well? Uh, sorry? Uh, does the Kustos also get recognized? Yes, 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 Kustos, we do Kustos. It, it, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting case. Uh, yeah, we, we've had difficulty with Kustos, uh, uh, but yes, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And next question in chat, uh, what pixel density or resolution uh, of an image is needed? Okay, so standard is 300, uh, uh, up to about 600. Beyond that, it gets a little too much for OMR, but anywhere between 300 DPI, the dot per inch, dots per inch uh, is fine. Unless you, you're working with miniatures, uh, then you might need a little more, uh, but you know, as you know, most the, the the manuscript we're working with are large, so we, you don't need that much more than that. All right. Uh, any more questions? Please raise your hand. Type in the chat. Oh, one more by Hannah Vohova. Um, this is a question going uh, somewhere else, but I was wondering, we had a presentation about uh, early music notation. Is it, uh, how is the other, uh, how are the other notations, so other, not early music, but other musics, do you have uh, similar complicated scores or do you have similar problems or other problems that you have to deal with, let's say Baroque music, or 18th century, late 18th century music? 
How different um, is the work with early music sources? So if it if it's print uh, in modern Western music notation, then I actually the commercial software is getting quite good. Uh, so anything that's that that you can use with the commercial software, I would use those. Uh, if they're in sort of early broken, things look quite different, or even uh, if it's a mat, you know, uh, handwritten notation, then it will be better uh, to use some other uh, non-commercial because the commercial ones can't deal with those. Um, we haven't done a lot uh, with sort of more later works, but yeah, things get a little more complicated when there are beams and stems and things like that, or even slurs. Yeah, those sort of sides varying symbols we're not very good at. Um, so yeah, that will be another, it'll take me another five, 10 years to do that. <laughs> or somebody else will do that. Thank you. Or doing that, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if there are no more questions, then uh, a huge uh, thank you to Professor Fuchinaga again. Uh, this was very illuminating. I also learned a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff has been going on with the project. And I'm looking forward to trying all this out. And, and please, please come tomorrow for Martha's, who will get into much more detail on this stuff. Yes, tomorrow's session is planned uh, to be uh, to actually show you how to use all this. So if you like today, please drop by tomorrow. Uh, you should have already received all the Zoom links, but I will send tomorrow's again so that it sits on top of your inbox. And uh, we are very much looking forward to seeing you all here tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.